Hyperkalemia is a condition where the concentration of potassium in the blood is elevated. The normal range is 3.5 to 5 milliequivalents per litre or millimoles per litre. But hyperkalemia is generally defined as a potassium level above 5.5 milliequivalents per litre. Potassium is mostly intracellular. 98% of body potassium is found within the cells, while only a small amount is present outside the cells. The gradient of the concentration difference between the inside and outside of the cell is important for several processes, including cell membrane potential, homeostasis of cell volume, and transmission of action potentials in nerves. Different mechanisms can lead to hyperkalemia. The first is ineffective elimination, often occurring in acute kidney injury due to the decrease in GFR, but also in chronic kidney disease, it occurs due to reduced response to aldosterone, as well as decreased sodium delivery to the distal tubules, which is where potassium is exchanged for sodium and then excreted. Medications are another common cause, specifically ACE inhibitors and angiotensin receptor blockers. Others include spironolactone, calcineurin inhibitors like cyclosporin and tacrolimus, and even low molecular weight heparin. Other ways of decreased excretion include a deficiency of aldosterone, such as in Addison's disease and congenital adrenal hyperplasia. Another mechanism for hyperkalemia is an excessive release from the cells. This can be caused by metabolic acidosis as hydrogen ions may be taken in from the extracellular fluid into the cell in exchange for a potassium ion in an attempt to reduce the acidity. Insulin increases potassium uptake into the cells, so a lack of insulin can lead to hyperkalemia as well. Conditions where there is an increase in tissue breakdown, such as rhabdomyolysis and burns, can also predispose to hyperkalemia. Then we have excessive intake, which can also cause hyperkalemia, but this is usually in the setting of renal pathology. In terms of clinical features, hyperkalemia is often asymptomatic, while other symptoms are mostly non-specific, including lethargy and weakness. Due to the effect on cardiac tissue, we may have palpitations and shortness of breath. Hyperventilation may also be present when there is metabolic acidosis. As for the diagnosis, of course we have the lab values of potassium, but we also repeat these to exclude hemolysis of the sample, which may cause a high reading. Then, to find the cause, renal function tests, including creatinine and blood urea nitrogen can be done, as well as glucose levels. These are the main lab values, and of course the drug history needs to be reviewed. Then we have ECG changes. The classic progression involves peaked T waves or tented T waves, a shortened QT interval, a lengthened PR interval, an absent P wave, increased QRS duration, and eventual development of the QRS into a sinusoidal wave. We generally see the repolarization changes, so the tented T waves at around 5.5 to 6 millimoles per litre. Then at around 6.5 millimoles per litre, we see the P wave changes and its disappearance. Then above seven and beyond, we have the widening QRS and sinusoidal QRS. Levels above nine usually result in cardiac arrest. The treatment primarily depends on the potassium levels and the ECG. With levels below 6.4 and no ECG changes, treatment is usually conservative and involves reducing the intake, reviewing the medications for any hyperkalemia-causing drugs, and monitoring potassium. Active treatment is required if any new arrhythmias occur or if potassium levels rise above 6.5. Calcium gluconate is used to stabilise myocardial excitability. It increases threshold potential and therefore restores a normal gradient between the threshold potential and the resting membrane potential. The aim with this treatment is to normalise the ECG. To help reduce the potassium level itself, insulin may be given because insulin leads to a shift of potassium ions into the cells. Glucose solution is usually given alongside this to avoid hypoglycemia. 
Salbutamol, which is a beta-2 agonist, may also be used, which again promotes movement of potassium into the cells. In severe cases, hemodialysis may be required, and longer term, loop diuretics like furosemide and thiazide diuretics may be required.